Well, good afternoon. There's only one place worse than being before lunch. It's being before the end and your travel out of here. So I'll try to be brief and try to be informative. And my job has been to um, sum up the meeting. And the irony does not escape me that what I'm trying to attempt is to reproduce what was done uh, for the last two days. <laughs> And therefore, I'm going to take a little liberty uh, with what I do. And therefore, I will hope that you'll score me at the end to see how well I, uh, how well I did. So um, what we're going to do, and the, is this, you advance with this? You see? I'm not following directions. OK. So we started this off on uh, yesterday morning with restoring faith in the research enterprise with a call to action. And um, Malcolm and Henry gave some very insightful talks. And obviously, it started um, with open, frank, honest. And it was very hard talk. And we heard about the Jeremiah effect, exposing the sins of us all, whether intentional or not. Um, we heard about pharma's validation of um, roughly 60% of studies that pose challenges to reproducibility. Um, we've heard about how to increase value and reduce waste through randomization, blinding, power calculations, and a number of other specifications that would help to improve the reproducibility uh, issue. And it was also rather um, interesting to me, at least, to hear that it's not just somebody like me, but it's actually the institutions that uh, we see 15%, I think, was the uh, quoted percentage where there was a reduction of bias between institutions. Um, it was mentioned that the expansion recently in the biomedical research enterprise, in fact, called supersized expansion and others, uh, merely accentuated, accentuated the challenges of flatline budgets when it comes to how we conduct research. Um, there was also talk about anxiety and competition for a shrinking pie and haste all fostering mistakes. And there was a call for a Louis Pasteur effect, and that is going back to basics and identifying causes to target solutions. But there were hopeful signs at the end of that session. It wasn't all doom and gloom. The ARRIVE guidelines were discussed, the Story Landis article, camaraderies, and a whole host of other things that were discussed in terms of being hopeful for the future. Then we moved on to a totally different spectrum of discussion regarding citizens and science and how reproducibility directly impacts public perceptions. Robert uh, Bazell from Yale joined us as well as Jan Piotrowski from The Economist in Sao Paulo. I don't know if Jan is still here or if he's on his plane back to Sao Paulo. But there's a, um, what I learned was that there's a public perception of science as uh, as uh, suggested in this cartoon where there's the random medical news effect of how the public really sees us. Um, and it was interesting also to me that the public is less interested in the process details and more they want the big picture. They want cures. They want accessibility to health care and that type of thing. They want to make sure there's no secrets though too. The public also looks for certainty as we heard. But as researchers, we explore uncertainty. So there's um, a conflict there in terms of what we do and how we want to expose what we do to the public. And in, I, I was also fascinated by the fact that unlike other areas of reporting, science actually imposes the narrative on the science writer. So we not only need the trust of the public, but we are actually um, blessed with the trust of the science writer themselves to actually write what we say and what we do. We also learned that the scientists must engage in direct-to-consumer messaging. And um, in support of that, there's a lot of public relations training that's all already underway. And of course, also, no surprise, we must continue to confront scientific illiteracy in the public. We then moved on to a topic we titled Great Expectations, a critical assessment of published research and a minds on exercise for workshop attendees. And Glenn Begley from Tetralogic Pharmaceuticals led that himself and did a fantastic job. And it got everyone up to speed on all the issues, as well as getting everyone hyperglycemic. <laughs> um, a spectrum of issues um, that don't challenge the validity of the scientific method were presented. The public debate. The public debate confirms the strength of the scientific system, and I thought that was a very good observation of his. 
The preclinical irreproducibility is a systemic problem that driven by incentives, and we heard all about them throughout the meeting, the careers, the need to publish in top-tier journals, um, positive studies, and so on. Um, but the PI and the institution are responsible, but we also heard that the funders and the journals can actually impose the change. And of course, we also learned about Begley's six criteria for scientific reports and blindness, showing all the results, repeating experiments, positive and negative controls, showing validated reagents as well as statistical um, uh, methods. Heard but not learned, the impact and outcomes of previous ILR efforts. Um, efforts. So Jeff Everett from GlaxoSmithKline and Kadran Hendrickson from Netherlands Vaccine Institute talked about what's already been done and what was the impact of what's already been done? Well, those earlier discussions were, I've learned, aimed at journal editors primarily, and reproducibility, though, was central in their message. What I learned was that everybody knows what to do. It's just the question is, how do you implement, engage, and enforce what to do? There were definitely cultural differences with the European Union's delay of the arrival in the United States. And we also learned that good animal care is different from good animal science. This, both are necessary, both are needed, both are critically important, but they are separate. Harmonization versus standardization can be somehow harmonized through adopting core principles. And also very important is just to be competent obviously is not enough, but there needs to be a commitment to affect change. We then moved on to all hands on deck, actions taken to date, and uh, Gilly Griffin from the Canadian Council for Animal Care spoke as well as, as well as Jonathan Kimmelman at McGill University. And this was one of my more difficult presentations to have to write notes from because it was so jam packed with really good stuff. So I congratulate both Gilly and Jonathan for that. There are many motivating factors um, in terms of uh, what's been done to date in terms of poor design, little translation, animal waste. The 2011 Montreal Declaration called for a change in culture and recognized that reporting of data is key. The guidelines endorsed and to some extent implemented these changes, but little impact has been seen so far. Um, ICLIS harmonization efforts and the 10 principles that Gilly talked about. There are problems in planning, design, reporting, and uptake. And there are activities such as systematic review, preclinical registry, CSAR, and all sorts of things that were, have been developed to address these problems. And there are many opportunities. Uh, stakeholders, and I was particularly interested to hear about naming NCATS. It was named not only yesterday, but also today, and their potential role in this process, which I found uh, very, very interesting, and as well as research, research domains and programmatic opportunities. We went, then went back and talked and revisited Russell and Birch and looked how we can reconcile reproducibility with replacement reduction and refinement and learned from Michael Festing, an independent consultant, and Stephen Latham from Yale University about the clinical, the large N, small effect versus the preclinical, small N, larger effect. And since World War II, we learned that the replacement of the three R's was actually the most common that had taken place. Of course, we can't forget Michael's tea and milk experiment, trying to outline how experimental design trumps the sample size. But those current problems relate to the excessive numbers of false positives, and we heard that as well uh, today. And of course, we also heard at that time about the need for training, both in design, biometrics, as well as statistics. And then we heard from Stephen about how the three, other, three R's uh, today struggle in the biphasic U.S. law, both statutory through the AWA as well as professional self-regulation. Can research integrity be incentivized? Brian Martinson um, from Health Partners Institute for Education and Research and Elizabeth Marincola from PLOS. Again, a jam-packed session, and I probably didn't do justice to this, but um, it was very important um, that I like how they took off and said, well, before we get to incentives, let's talk about how to understand the disincentives, disincentives, because understanding that will inform paths to incentivizing good behavior. And the example was given with the growth rate in the research workforce actually has exceeded the population, uh, US population growth rate. 
And the context, that is, for example, the fear of job loss, directly influences the quality and the integrity of the work that's published. Now, institutions are not alone in this. Institutions can create the environment promoting responsible conduct. The survey of organizational research climate or source tracks these local factors, and that's a welcome development. And there's many tools available and soon coming available, such as the PLOS form for post-publication peer review to promote dynamic and transparent research. This morning we started off with a great series of lectures in talking about the reproducibil reproducibility challenges in the next generation of animal models. And Roger Reeves from Johns Hopkins, Jeffrey Rogers from Baylor, and Monty Westerfield from University of Oregon talked about mice, monkeys, and fish. And it was pointed out that technologies will not save us, but the new tools can certainly help in our efforts to emphasize reproducibility. I also really enjoyed the uh, analysis of the stock market, how the scientific literature is really the stock market of fallible thought, and that we're designed to make mistakes and build on those mistakes and to do better, of course. All men, all persons, I guess I should say, to be correct, but not scientists are created equally. That was the message we got today. Um, and this can be a challenge to replication. And that was referring to the comment about experiments conducted in one lab may not be reproducible because maybe that lab isn't particularly expert. In terms of mice, we learned to justify the use of inbreds and standardize and, or at least detail the phenotyping. In the non-human primates, the genetic diversity is both the strength as well as a challenge. And in fish, marvelous uh, presentation of in vivo analysis at high resolution. They can be used rapidly, inexpensive, but then the morpholinos can have both positive and negative impacts. The bottom line was, as we've been hearing throughout, is you publish a paper to get the grant to keep your job. It only adds to the stress. How can we then improve the reliability of published results? Well, Galen Edwards from American Physiological Society, Damian Pattinson from PLOS, and Victoria Stodden from Columbia University mentioned the following. Um, talking about flexible instructions to authors with uh, the animal numbers being the number one concern. The editors are listening, which is good to hear. They want to, they are support the uh, possibility of publishing negative results and even a pre-approved experimental plan. There is an effort to improve the quality of reporting, but also correcting and updating the literature and keeping it live and dynamic. The phrase ubiquity of error was brought up, which is very, very interesting, and as, is, as it was in, indicated, is the central motivator for the scientific method. And parsing re reproducibility between the empirical, the computational, as well as the statistical fractions. And really, what's most important is keeping it relevant, and that's where the idea of the research compendium was brought up by Victoria. So how about the IOs, the vets, the institutions, the IA cooks? How can we make internal regulators partners in this reform effort? And Catherine Bain from ALAC International, Stuart Zola from Emory, as well as Jerry Collins from Yale, talked about the standards of care and use, guided by science to promote high quality science. And of course, we can't forget the amazing Zola and his magic reproducible ropes. I'll never forget that. The animal resources provide an environment conducive to reproducibility. Again, an institutional responsibility. And there's a, a need for a judicious application of the regulations and guidelines we already have, because these will benefit, and, and also the benefits of transparency. And the pathway identified as the proper care and use of animals, and these are considered scientific variables, leads to quality science, facilitates the three Rs, and hopefully then facilitates reproducibility. And then lastly, the ounce of prevention worth a billion of cure. Of course, this comes from the old adage of pound of pre ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, but really there was more than an ounce of topics and things discussed in this session. So uh, the ounce doesn't do justice to really what was presented by John Ionidas from Stanford, Paul Braunschweiger from the City Program, as well as Guylaine Poirier from Glax GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, I think the big message is promoting reproducibility is a shared responsibility. We're not in this alone. No one's in this alone. Um, the, reducing the bias to optimize the effect sizes and embrace integrity. Um, no study is an island, and that refers to the geometry, the workforce, the rewards, as well as the transparency. And seek out accreditation, content experts, education and training in, t in terms of 
uh, preventing uh, irreproducibility. Data sharing integrity was mentioned with the benefits of rep the benefit to reputation, science, as well as animals, and finally, responsible data sharing and management being critical to the success of that effort. So where do we go from here? Well, here's the proposal, a proposed action for moving forward. What we propose is a convocation of stakeholders committed to overcoming the challenges of reproducibility. What's the rationale for this proposed action? Well, you know, there have been small tent meetings. There was just one on Monday that we were had heard about uh, where the journals and funders got together. There's ours, a small tent, but they're not fully inclusive of everyone, all the stakeholders that need to be in the room at the same time, because we all have common themes that we share. There's areas of agreement, and we've heard here, and there's agreement to disagree, at least for now, waiting a further discussion. And there's targets of opportunities, and those targets are the PIs, the institutions, the journals, and the funders all need to be in the one big tent for that discussion because the impact will be on us all today and tomorrow for the public good and for the public trust. And in doing so, we'll strengthen our resolve, we'll advance science, and we'll invigorate discovery. And so I'll close this by saying hopefully what this would lead to is an optimization of the four R's for effective translation. Thank you very much. So I guess I want to say at this time, before everybody races for the door, I think it's important to thank everyone here at the ILR and National Academy, so Lita and Angela. I want to thank my um, co-chair of my committee, uh, our committee, uh, Steve Nemi in the back there, who started this off, as well as the planning committee for this meeting, as well as the entire roundtable. So, and thank you all for uh, participating. Lita, did you want to say a few things? Um, not much else to say except thank you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed being here for the last two days. It was a very jam-packed meeting. I hope that we will be able to follow up on this. We will try our best. Um, I think uh, Ken's message is critical that we all have to do this together. I mean, this meeting was great, but it's just only one portion of the many people that have to be part of this. And so other many meetings, small meetings, we should stop meeting in small meetings, actually, in order to actually be able to do some change, to implement something. So I hope to see you all and many more in the next meeting when we're going to have it, hopefully not too long from today. Thank you. <laughs>